Test, test, test. Will that be loud enough? Hey. Test, 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 test. Can everybody hear me with that? Clear in the back? Is that better?
and I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a very uh, timely uh, forum we're having, considering uh, the commissioners just addressed this issue in their last meeting, and the city council at McMinnville addressed it uh, two nights ago in their meeting. So I'm happy to have you all here. Um, <coughs> uh, I will make one apologize right off the front. Uh, our one panel member, Todd Delato, was unable to get back from Ashland today, uh, where he was a speaker at another conference. So we brought in Andrew Gwynn, who is a facility owner in uh, Southeast Portland. So, all right, so we're gonna get started. My name is Anthony Taylor, uh, and I will be the moderator for this evening. And I am the uh, co a co-founder and current director of Compassionate Oregon. And um, as I said, we're very pleased to be off uh, presenting this panel this evening. And um, I want to thank McMinimums, of course, for providing the venue and our elected officials for taking time out of their very busy schedule. We slid it in between one annual dinner last night and the marriage ball Saturday night. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'm also pleased uh, tonight to introduce the other founding member of Compassionate Oregon, Cheryl Smith. Cheryl Smith is in the office, if you wouldn't mind standing in the audience. <laughs> Cheryl is the executive director of Eugene's Compassion Clinic, serving medical marijuana p patients in Lane County and the surrounding area. She also sits on the advisory committee for medical marijuana. She is an author, an attorney, and was the primary drafter of the Oregon uh, Death with Dignity Act, and we're very pleased to have her. Thanks for coming up from Eugene tonight. <clears throat> what we're going to do this evening is give everyone a brief summary of the law regulating medical marijuana facilities, which takes effect March 1st. I know some of our audience members know a lot about this issue on both sides, both pro and con. Um, but more importantly, though, we're trying to reach those people that don't know how the w w law works and have some concerns and are looking for some answers. So we're also going to try and wrap it up sooner than later. So when you get a chance to ask a question, please be concise and stay on point. Um, don't start talking about growing marijuana in Southern Oregon when we're talking about medical marijuana facilities here. So um, Also, please keep in mind, it's an instructional panel, informal uh, event. And so be polite, try not to interrupt, be respectful, and of course, always be compassionate. So to start, uh, we are gonna present a few slides that we hope will bring everyone up to speed that doesn't know much about the law. And um, after that, we'll bring the panel up, introduce them, let them offer a brief statement, and then I'll start throwing some questions at them. Uh, there are cards being circulated in the audience if you want to write a question down. Um, we will get those cards up front. Also, let me just back up for a second. There is water in the back. You're certainly welcome to that. Um, there are a little uh, information table right at the entry where we have our brochures and our donation envelopes. Please feel free to fill them fully. Um, and then Bernadette Hansen, she will be our floor person. She's back there in the back and she will be making sure your cards get picked up and making sure that when you come up the microphone you get a chance to get up there and um, she'll help you keep your questions uh, brief and to the point. Okay, so a few words about Compassionate Oregon. We were, uh, we, were found, we founded last year uh, to advocate for the medical, for the rights of medical marijuana patients and their families. This advocacy seems rather important now as the state begins to be trending towards legalizing recreational use by adults. As this happens, the trend will be to move away from medical marijuana programs as we have begun to see happen in Washington. We believe that the therapeutic value, however, of cannabis will continue to help many people and the, the law we are here to discuss tonight will play a major role in providing safe access for those medications. Many of our Yamhill County patients, currently numbering over a thousand, are not able to provide for themselves and have no grower to provide for them. This law will help provide that access. Compassionate Oregon worked a lot in last uh, legislative session and 
with the help of Senator Boquist, we uh, <clears throat> introduced and passed Senate Bill 281, which added PTSD to the list of debilitating conditions uh, for the use of medical marijuana. We hope that uh, the veterans out there that need help uh, will now be able to get it, and uh, any first responders or any people like that that are suffering from pr traumatic stress will be uh, able to get some relief. Uh, several other changes uh, in the statutes dealing with marijuana were passed last session as well, including sentencing reform for marijuana-related offenses. One of the biggest changes, however, was the licensing of medical marijuana facilities, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening. So, let's get started. This is our agenda. We're going to have, as I said, some opening statements and uh, then the introduction of panel members, questions for the panel members, and then we'll kick it open to the audience. Compassionate Oregon is an Oregon political action committee dedicated to protecting the rights of medical marijuana patients and their families. Uh, we also work for sentencing reform and elimination of minimum mandatory sentencing and discriminatory policies based on conviction for drug laws and we support the implementation of the medical marijuana facilities statute. When Governor John Kitzhaber signed this, the bill into law, he said there are two main goals we wish to achieve. First, we want to ensure the overall safety of our communities through appropriate rules to license and regulate dispensaries. And second, we want to allow the patients safe access to medical if they are eligible for treatment under the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. He also said, I believe it will be critical to set fees for dispensaries that will provide sufficient funding for OHA so that they can be extraordinarily vigorous in their enforcement of the rules they are, that are developed. I highlighted, or parentheses, the OHA because that's what he was talking about. Sometimes this uh, particular paragraph gets confused that it's law enforcement's job to vigorously enforce these uh, statutes, which it's a partnership, of course, but um, try that door on the end, please. It's a partnership, but the OHA is the one that's responsible for administering the program, enforcing the laws, and regulating the dispensaries, and they are tasked with doing it vigorously. So if they come into a dispensary and things are out of order, they're not tracking everything they're supposed to be tracking, then they will be written up, and um, there is a possibility they could have their license revoked. So, the law. It was originally House Bill 3460. It was added to the uh, statutes that uh, deal with the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. Oops. Wrong button. The, this is the law. The Oregon Health Authority shall establish, by rule, a medical marijuana facility registration system to authorize the transfer of usable marijuana and immature marijuana plants. The preamble to the administrative rules say that a person may not establish, maintain, manage, or operate a facility without that license. And it does not in any way, it does not in any way protect anybody from possible criminal prosecution under federal law. Okay, so that's the law. Here are the rules. And there are a bunch of them. Way too many to put up here and bore you all with. But here's the highlights. Cannot be within a thousand foot of a public school, private elementary, secondary, or career school that is attended primarily by minors. Now, I know there's some concern about preschools because just recently in Portland, a facility was sort of cited directly across the street from preschools. But in uh, legislation that was passed this last session, they addressed the thousand foot rule and more clearly defined it, and they left preschools out of it. The primary reason for leaving preschools out is because typically preschool age children are under the supervision of their parents when they get dropped off and when they get picked up. It's not like in junior high and, or middle school these days, in high school where the students are just released and they go running around the neighborhood and they go across in front of them. 
It's kind of tricky because typically a school is site is in within a residential area and you're not allowed to site a facility in a residential area anyway. So you can't be located within a thousand feet of another facility. This is to minimize grouping uh, like uh, was happening in California and in Colorado as well. Uh, they felt that uh, one every 12, 10 or 12 blocks would be plenty. Minors are not allowed in any area of a facility where marijuana is present. The rules require an entry room, you know, uh, where uh, people can come in and have intake taken. And um, that room has no marijuana in it, and that is the only room a minor is allowed to be. It can't be any place else in the facility. No use of marijuana on the premises. The only exception to this is if an employee is actually a patient and needs to medicate while at work. He is required to do that out of sight of the public behind locked doors. More rules. Must be located in an area that's zoned properly. You can't be in a residential area. You have to be in commercial or industrial or mixed use uh, agricultural area. And you cannot have a dispensary at the same address as a grow site. So if you're growing plants in your house, you can't have a dispensary in your house or, you know, your business. All facilities must test for mold, mildew, and pesticides and keep all lab reports for all testing results. This was a very big concern when this bill was first drafted because uh, there has been some reports of people with asthma or uh, other breathing uh, conditions that um, can be troubled by this, uh, mold spores and mildew, and of course pesticides, we all know the story there, so um, that was written into the statute for sure, and um, it is elaborated in the um, rules. All usable marijuana must be labeled. You have to be able to look at the label and tell what percentage of THC is in the package. It also requires CBDs. That's a little technical, but those are the types of, uh, you know, the mini 400 chemicals in marijuana. That's one of them that helps with anti-inflammatory issues and uh, things of that nature. And finally, it must include a warning label. Got to have that label on there, and it has to be bigger than any other letters on the label. So when you pick it up, that's the first thing you should see. How much is it gonna cost a facility owner? Well, it starts off with a non-refundable application fee of $500, and this is to pay for the Oregon Health Authority's background check, criminal background check that they have to perform on the person responsible for the facility. It also will help uh, cover um, inspections and uh, you know uh, making getting the application forms together and all that sort of stuff then you have to step up to the plate once you've been uh, authorized to get an I or issued a license and pay this much money $3,500 so if you're gonna open a medical marijuana dispensary in Yamhill County that's how much it's gonna cost you for your first year second year looks an awful lot the same that's a renewable fee, renewable uh, application fee, because they have to run a background check on you again. Every year the authority is required to run a background check. The last thing is the additional startups costs required by rules. The rules require that you have to have a good security system with cameras and uh, recording so that all that uh, video can be stored and looked at later by authorities if they need to. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. You have to have commercial grade locks on all your entry doors and uh, you have to have a point of sale uh, software that enables uh, every purchase, every transfer in or out of the facility to be recorded so that the authority can take a look at your records and make sure you're doing things the way you're supposed to be doing them. This is how the Oregon Marijuana Program works. The Oregon Health Authority is the overarching agency that looks after the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. Originally, it provided cards for the grower. Well, let me back up for a second. The patient and, his, and or his caregiver 
and then a grower. The patient, the only way a patient could get marijuana was to grow it himself, find a grower that would grow it for him, or find some charitable soul that would give them their marijuana. At that time, the patient, the only money that was allowed to change hands was from the patient to the grower, and you could only reimburse the grower for the cost of his materials, like his dirt and fertilizers, and his utilities. You could not give him any money for labor or other costs of doing business, like insurance costs and packaging and processing and all that sort of stuff. And so that's why uh, you see the red, the reimbursement, that's the money coming from the patient to the grower and the marijuana going from the grower to the patient. The patient is allowed to have 24 ounces of marijuana at any and all times. And uh, that uh, number is actually, can be divided between the grower, patient, and caregiver. Between the three of them, they're not supposed to exceed the 24 ounce limit. So last session, after years of complaining by the growers and the patients, and now the facilities, because some of them had set up and were starting to dispense cannabis to uh, you know, patients with, uh, with no charge. They weren't adding anything onto it. If they got it for $4 a gram, they were giving it away for $4 a gram. So it was problematic. And so last session, they sat down and they created the medical marijuana facility and PRFs, persons responsible for facilities. The PRF must be background checked, including fingerprints. It has to go through uh, a whole lot of stuff. There's a lot of hoops to jump through on this um, statute. The medical marijuana facility can now take in marijuana from a grower and distribute it to a patient that has no way to get marijuana. And the patient can give money to the facility and the facility gives that money back to the grower you're not allowed to make a profit, but you can figure in your cod normal cost of doing business. So if you buy from a grower uh, marijuana that's costing you $7 a gram and your cost of doing business is $4 a gram, you can only charge $11 a gram because you can't substantiate uh, anything else and they don't want anybody making money off of the transfer of marijuana, that's illegal. So that's where we are right now that's how it works. And um, just a couple other quick things and we'll get the panel up here. This law has been controversial right from the start. They think it will be, um, well, first of all, there are some flaws in it as uh, you know, the, some of the people have pointed out already. Um, but we, uh, they're, gonna let it, they're gonna let it work for a little while um, and, uh, and see what happens. Um, so, but in, with respect to that, a lot of the local ordinances like a Medford and, and uh, Ashland and Corvallis have talked about it, Mc City of McMinnville two nights ago have talked about an outright ban on this. But according to the Legislative Council, we conclude that HB 3460 preempts most municipal laws specifically tar targeting medical marijuana facilities and a and a municipality may not act contrary to state law merely because the municipality believes that the action will be better carry out the purposes and objective of federal law. So that's what the Legislative Council has said. The League of Oregon Cities and the uh, Association of Oregon Counties differs with that and they have a different interpretation and so this uh, next coming session, they have introduced a law that will allow local municipalities to regulate, restrict, or prohibit uh, dispensaries at the local level. So that's about it. Let me bring up the panel. We're going to um, um, let me get back to the bio pages and all that. And um, why don't uh, everybody just come on up and uh, grab a seat, and then we'll inter I'll introduce everybody. Nice round of applause. Again, I am very, very honored that these uh, elected officials could take time out of their schedules to uh, come up here and uh, participate in this. Um, we're going to start on the far end with Andrew Gwynn. He is a facility owner and operator that is right now 
uh, you know, bringing his facility up to speed. His facility is in southeast uh, Portland, and he is really doing everything he can to get all the cameras in place and all, all the things that the rules require. And uh, he uh, started a chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy at Chemeketa Community College while a student there. And if you have any computer questions, write them on the card, he'll answer them <laughs> after, after. Um, the next is uh, Annette Frank. She is a Dayton City Council member and was elected in 2012. Annette has a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences with an emphasis on policy. She has in, been involved in her community for the past 10 years and is currently a city councilor in Dayton and the secretary treasurer for the Friends of the Mary Gilkey Library. Okay. Next, Commissioner Stern. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Stern was elected to the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners in 2002 and is now serving her third and final term as commissioner and serves as the chair of the commission. She also currently serves on the board of directors for the Willamette Valley Commission and in November 2012 became the first ever Yamhill County Commissioner elected as the president of the Association of Oregon Counties. Mary currently serves on the board of directors for the Willamette Valley Cancer Foundation, YCAP's Resource Development Committee, and the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. Sheriff Jack Crabtree was also elected in 2002 after a long and distinguished career in the Yamhill County Law Enforcement Sheriff's Department and is also serving his last term. Uh, he is a member of the National Western States and Oregon State Sheriff's Association, has been a corrections officer, a patrol deputy, and a detective. He has uh, served with distinction and been honored for Outstanding Achievement Award and Investigator of the Year by the Oregon Police Officers Association. Sheriff Crabtree was a member of the Rules Advisory Committee that helped write the rules for this law, and he is currently chair of the Yamhill Interagency Narcotics Task Team. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. So since, we're, uh, since uh, Mary is at the top of the chain on, uh, in the county, we're going to start with her and let her uh, do a little bit of an opening statement. And uh, you'll have to share the mic, um, but uh, we're used to that. Well, hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK back there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK. I'll put my glasses on so I can see you in the back. If we're not loud enough, just wave, and I'll try. I have a big mouth. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. What Anthony didn't tell you is I'm also an attorney, uh, graduated law school in Boston, and then worked for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and came to Oregon because I was a staff attorney out in Sheridan. Um, I, it, this is such a complicated situation that's going on now with, with these laws. There's a lot of differing... Um, state law regarding land use, regarding agricultural use, regarding uh, whether local jurisdictions can even uh, regulate seeds or nursery stock, which marijuana is considered a nursery stock. So, and there are so many questions that are, that are floating around about this. You know, can we keep the public safe? In the rural areas, are there many areas where we could site these facilities? We don't have a lot of commercial or industrial area in, uh, in the county, in the rural areas of the county. And um, it, it, we've, we had a meeting last week. I had asked that the sheriff and the district attorney and the two commissioners, our uh, county council and assistant County Council and our uh, planning manager come and, and sit together and talk about possibilities, you know, what can we face, what do we know, what don't we know, and it's, uh, we're in limbo right now is how we feel, as are the folks who are interested in applying for dispensary permits. I mean, they don't know what we want to do. We had Jim come to us in November, I believe, and ask, what, what are your plans? And we couldn't meet until uh, January to really sit down and talk about them and try and figure this out. So the first thing I want to tell you is that we have a, a public hearing planned for next Thursday 
at 10 a.m. in room 32 of the courthouse. And we're hoping to hear from as many people as possible to hear what you have to say about this. And uh, we apologize, it's during the day. For those of you who can't make it, you're welcome to send in any written comments. We'd appreciate those. If you go on the county website, all of the commissioners have their uh, web addresses, their email addresses up there. Um, or if you just send it to me and I'll make sure we get copies for all of the commissioners and for all the staff who will be attending that meeting. But uh, you know, I'm interested in hearing the discussion I will tell you right now, my uh, father-in-law uh, is back in New Jersey and is, has been undergoing cancer treatment for the last uh, over a year and a half, almost two years. He currently, he has bile duct cancer, primary, and uh, liver cancer is a secondary and has had some other, others floating around. He, he's not hungry. He can't eat. He doesn't know what to eat. My mother-in-law is just beside herself trying to figure out, what do I cook? She cooks everything. She tries everything to try and find something my father-in-law will eat. He's only, he's going to be 72 years old. That's young, and it gets younger every day, but, and was up until the cancer, the healthiest person I've known. So, you know, I understand the compassionate side of this. I, I worry if he were here, now he's a federal judge, so I don't think he'd be smoking any marijuana, but what, you know, if he wanted it, how would, he, and was here, how would he get it? And it, 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 it's, I would want him or me to be able to go to a pharmacy, a dispensary, and be able to purchase it for him in a safe and secure place. But you know, so there are, there are all the, then on the other hand, I've been the liaison with the Sheriff's Office for many years and we've worked on this evidence-based decision-making initiative, really trying to ensure that we're doing the best with your tax dollars to have a safe and secure community, yet being effective with the way that we handle our criminal justice system here. So I, I worry about the impacts of public safety, so it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult position to be in. Uh, well, I'm interested in hearing what the panel has to say and hearing what all of you has to have to say as well. Thank you very much. Well, you're next on the uh, packing order, so uh, Sheriff Jack Crabtree. I'm above you on the packing order. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 I appreciate the uh, invitation. I really do. Um, you know, this is House Bill 3460. Uh, was a was a bill that was sponsored uh, and promoted by Representative Buckley, Senator Prozanski, Representative Frederick, and Senator Dingfelder in the 2013 legislative session. Uh, this was a law that was not referred to the voters, but simply passed by uh, legislators. Uh, as you've heard, the law basically allows for medical marijuana dispensaries to open up uh, throughout the state of Oregon. The, uh, the law actually came into effect uh, in July of 2013, and I was asked, uh, of course the OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, was tasked with uh, putting rules together to uh, regulate the uh, dispensaries. Excuse me. I was asked to set on that rules advisory committee as a representative of the Oregon State Sheriff's Association. The group basically consisted of 13 people. Two were law enforcement. One was the chief of police of Corvallis, John Sassaman, myself, and then we had a district attorney from Lincoln County, Rob Bet. <clears throat> our purpose, our task was to provide the OHA with guidance uh, and suggestions on how to properly implement the uh, House Bill 3460. The problem that I see, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold my issues until what I'm sure will be asked, but just kind of a general uh, sense of the actual Rules Advisory Committee, which is referred to as the RAC. Uh, one of the issues that we'll talk more about later um, that, that I had, and, then, and I know the other uh, the DA and the, uh, the other chief of police had as well, is that we were limited in terms of what we could suggest uh, for rules, rec uh, recommendations, regulations, 
to what the law already had, you know, placed in law. For example, if if the law said only so much money can be collected, we couldn't suggest that they allocate additional dollars to the program to make it effective. For example, as an example, the law is the law. We had no ability whatsoever to change the law at that point. So I just want to make that clear because when people see my name on that committee and they see the final rules, I want you to understand that we had some very tight constraints on what we could and couldn't do. Um, at any rate, so the, uh, the idea was for us to, to meet, which we did, and we, uh, they final, the OHA uh, director was to finalize the rules, and they'll start asking for application with, I think, the 3rd of March or so. And then sometime after that, uh, dispensaries will start opening up. So um, I put together some concerns that I have about dispensaries, and uh, we'll, we'll get into that more later. But uh, following what uh, Commissioner Stern said about compassion, um, I had my grandmother, who I loved dearly, um, also had cancer. She fought it for nine years or longer. Uh, and she had every cancer known to mankind. And uh, I can tell you I'm very compassionate about people who have cancer, but I also know that my grandmother, if she were alive today fighting that cancer, um, that there are, there are absolute alternatives to her getting her medicine than to get that at a dispensary uh, in the city of McIndoe or any place else. Um, there is an Oregon Medical Marijuana Law that allows growers to uh, supply uh, marijuana to those who want it. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But in terms of compassion for people who actually need uh, help, I'm there. So I don't want any confusion on that. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you. I would just like to add to uh, Sheriff Crabtree's comments about the Rules Advisory Committee. The Rules Advisory Committee, they convene to advise the Office of the Attorney General what rules they're, you know, to help them write the rules, but it's really the AG's office that writes the rules. And there was many occasions where uh, DA uh, Bavette and um, uh, other people raised concerns that just fell on deaf ears because the AG wasn't going to write it that way. And so it was frustrating for law enforcement on the community as well as industry experts. So, and in fact, we're still tr struggling with the testing issue right now, and hopefully we'll get that ironed out. But, okay, the next person on the, um, on the dais is uh, Annette Frank. She is a council member from Dayton, uh, Oregon, just across the highway there. And so, you're up. Hi, everybody. Um, the whole purpose I got involved um, is, can't hear me? Hi, everybody. Is that better? <laughs> okay. The, uh, first off, I want to say thank you for everybody coming. And um, also, I wanted to strictly say I am not representing the city of Dayton's views. We haven't come to any kind of decision about what we are or aren't going to do. We've had a, a little discussion, but not major discussion. So I just want to get that out there, that I do not represent the city of Dayton's views. I am merely coming from it from an elected perspective. Um, and part of the reason I became involved was because we've had some issues in town with people growing their own medical marijuana, which the law allows. But in a small town, and in my perspective, there are issues that complicate so many things in a 